festival of mind, body and spirit held each year in London is a vast supermarket of new religious movements and a reminder that we now live in one of the most pluralist societies ever seen. Ancient Rome was once like this. The old civic religion ran out of steam, leaving a spiritual vacuum. And in came occult religions from the East and new philosophies of every description. They met a need then. Perhaps there's a similar spiritual vacuum today that these sects are filling. At the festival can be seen reflections of many of our programs. The influence of science shows in the space religions and the movements that are evidently influenced by Darwin because they stress the body and our kinship with animals and nature. And then Freud and Jung surely underlie all those sects that promise to clean up our consciousness and heal our personalities. And there's the humanism of so many of these sects, their man-centered outlook. They're promising to help us to become better, more integrated persons. But the most pervasive influence of all comes from the East. 200 years ago, the Oriental religions were hardly at all known in the West. Today, they're everywhere. Now, how did all this come about? How did we change over from having a single faith that overarched everything and was itself the standard of public knowledge by which everything else was assessed to today's spiritual confusion. In the Middle Ages, when religion was a force powerful enough to create whole civilizations, it was natural to see the whole world from the point of view of your own faith. Here in Hereford Cathedral, they have a magnificent 13th century Christian map of the world. On this map, we look down from above at the hemisphere of Earth. On the vertical axis, at the very top, Christ in judgment, and below it, the Tower of Babel, from which the nations were scattered. At the bottom, the pillars of Hercules at Gibraltar, the limit of the known world. Elsewhere, we find things like Joseph's barns in Egypt and the site of Noah's Ark. But most significant of all, the center of the map is Jerusalem, the focus of meaning for a Christian. In fact, on the whole map, theology shapes geography. This map's designed to express the Christian vision of the world. But there were other perspectives, too. This very diagrammatic Muslim map comes from the same period as the Christian map. It shows all the cities of the known world in relation to Mecca, the center of Islamic faith, here represented by the black stone, the Kaaba. But European explorers were to make possible a new kind of map, a multi-faith map. This is a mission map prepared for the Free Kirk of Scotland in 1893. Here it's been realized that there are several distinct world religions, each with its own territory. On this map, the different Christian denominations, Protestant, Catholic and Orthodox, are shown white red and yellow, and then in green there are the vast territories of Islam, and in grey, all lumped together, Hindus, Buddhists, and I'm afraid what they call devil worshippers. Well, at one time, the very fact that a map like this could now be drawn was thought to present a serious difficulty. 
How could God have allowed whole civilizations to live for thousands of years without ever hearing the gospel? What do you do with all those people on the day of judgment? And what view was to be taken of their religions? The traditional view had been clear cut. Outside the church, there was no salvation. When you reached the boundaries of Christendom, you passed over into a land of paganism and unbelief, where people were in the grip of demonic illusions. The reports back to Britain that came from the early missionaries confirmed traditional prejudices against other religions. In India, Bishop Heber's popular hymn summed up the attitude of those early missionaries. The heathen in his blindness bows down to wood and stone. It's still sung today. But even in Heber's time, European attitudes were beginning to change. Our gradual changeover from a one-faith to a multi-faith outlook began about 200 years ago. It was British rule in India which opened a channel along which Indian religious thought could percolate back to Europe, often in the most unexpected ways, and gradually our exclusively Christian attitudes began to change. From the 1780s, the Indian religious classics began to appear in European translations. The story of their impact on one great continental thinker begins here, in of all places, the leafy London suburb of Wimbledon. In the year 1803, to improve his English, a German boy came to Nelson House School in Wimbledon High Street. The boy was Arthur Schopenhauer. In Wimbledon, Schopenhauer did indeed perfect his English but it was here that he also picked up his lifelong aversion to Christianity. Schopenhauer complained bitterly to his parents about the cant and hypocrisy of English religion. He admired Jesus, whom he saw as an ascetic, but he did not like, three times a Sunday, the worldly religion of Jane Austen's England. If you wish to see with your own eyes what early inoculation of belief does, look at the English. For this they have to thank the clergy, who take care to inculcate all the articles of belief at the earliest age in such a way as to result in a kind of partial paralysis of the brain. This then shows itself throughout their whole life in a silly bigotry. Protestantism has given up the innermost kernel of Christianity by eliminating asceticism. In the end, this results in a doctrine of a loving father who made the world in order that things might go very pleasantly in it, and in this, of course, he was bound to fail, and who, if only we conform to his will in certain respects, will afterwards provide an even pleasanter world in which case it is only to be regretted it has so fatal an entrance. This may be a good religion for comfortable, married and civilised Protestant parsons, but it is not Christianity. After Schopenhauer returned to Germany, he lived for a while with his mother at Weimar. There, Goethe encouraged him and a visiting scholar gave him a translation of the Hindu Upanishads, lofty philosophical poems of about the same date as the New Testament, but previously unknown in the West. These Hindu scriptures confirmed Schopenhauer's opinion that Christianity was narrow and provincial by comparison. We send the Brahmins, English clergymen and evangelical linen weavers to show them that they are created out of nothing and ought thankfully to rejoice in the fact. But it is just the same as if we fired a bullet against a cliff. In India, our religions will never take root. The ancient wisdom of the human race will not be displaced by what happened in Galilee. On the contrary, Indian philosophy streams back to Europe and will produce a fundamental change in our knowledge and thought.
In Schopenhauer's study, there were two figures. The image of the philosopher Kant stood for Kant's doctrine that the world around us is only representation, constructed by our minds from our sense experiences. The Buddha image reminded Schopenhauer that the way to release is by detachment from the world, inner calm, and the extinction of craving. He who has attained to the denial of the will to live, however poor, joyless, and full of privation his condition may appear externally, is yet filled with inward joy and the true peace of heaven. It is not the restless strain of life, but a peace that cannot be shaken, a deep rest and inward serenity. Schopenhauer did make one attempt at a job. He got a lectureship at Berlin, and then with typical arrogance put on his own lectures at the same time as Hegel's. He reasoned that if people had any sense, they'd obviously prefer him. Well, they didn't, and he resigned in a huff and turned himself into the cantankerous bachelor of Frankfurt with his rigid two-hour daily walk by the river. As he says, Schopenhauer's teaching is rather like the Buddha's. This world about us is only representation or appearance. Any order or reality we perceive in it has been put there by our own minds. Science can never penetrate to the inner truth of the world. All it can ever do is connect up appearances. The clue to the world's inner reality lies in the desire or craving that powers our own existence. We and everything else are the expressions and the prisoners of a blind, futile, eternal craving or striving that Schopenhauer calls the will, the struggle to exist. Only by turning it back upon itself and extinguishing it can we reach happiness. But that means our extinction, surely, because for Schopenhauer, consciousness can no more exist without the brain than digestion without the stomach. And yet, at the end, he hints at a kind of impersonal bliss, nirvana. The ephemeral... There are no other revelations than the thoughts of the wise, even if these are often clothed in strange allegories and myths and are then called religions. We freely acknowledge that what remains after the complete abolition of the will is, for those who are still full of the will, assuredly nothing. But also, conversely, to those in whom the will has turned and denied itself, this very real world of ours, with all its suns and galaxies, is nothing. To the world, the saints are nothing. But then, to the saints, the world is nothing. OK, is there anything that is something to the saints? Schopenhauer won't answer. We shouldn't have asked the question. His whole book, The World as Will and Representation, was designed to lead up to that final word, nothing. This idea that the highest truths of religion are inexpressible, can't be put into words, are indeed nothing, greatly influenced people like Tolstoy and Wittgenstein. More generally, if you've ever felt that human nature is irreparably flawed, that our chief passion, the sex drive, is too destructive and irrational ever to lead to lasting happiness, that the chief value of art lies in its capacity for a moment to take us out of ourselves, that all existence is on a countdown to extinction, then you're a disciple of Schopenhauer, he influenced generations of artists and writers, and his ideas became diffused through the modern novel, and especially the cinema. He's the original pessimistic Western intellectual. And yet, just because he's so pessimistic, he gives an unfair impression of Indian religion. There were others in his century to whom India came as a joyful liberation. The modern Republic of India was born in 1947. But the country had been awakened 50 years earlier. 
above all by a somewhat eccentric English woman of whom it's been said that no single person did so much to revive the Hindu's pride in his religious heritage as she. She was Annie Besant, whose strange career began in the 1870s. Born Annie Wood, the daughter of a poor but genteel widow, she'd been given only a meagre education. At 19, Full of devotion to Christ and desire to serve, she had done what everyone assured her was the obvious thing. She married a clergyman, Frank Besant, and went with him to a country parish in Lincolnshire. In the villages around Sibsey, she encountered the terrible sufferings of the rural poor. In one cottage, I'd found four generations sleeping in one room. The great-grandfather and his wife, the unmarried grandmother, the unmarried mother, the little child. And three men lodgers completed the tale of eight human beings crowded into that narrow, ill-ventilated garret. Other cottages were hovels, through the broken roofs of which poured the rain, and wherein rheumatism and ague lived with the human dwellers. How could I do aught but sympathise with any combination of workers that aimed at the raising of these poor. The conditions of the poor, and then the long and distressing illness of her own first child, undermined her belief in the justice of life. In addition, her husband appears to have been a brute, and her marriage was failing. Annie Besant began to lose her faith. The agony of the struggle was in the first 19 months. No one who has not felt it knows the fearful anguish inflicted by doubt on the earnestly religious soul. It seems to shipwreck everything. Is all blind chance? Is all the clash of unconscious forces? Or are we the sentient toys of an almighty power that sports with our agony? Annie Besant had an active, inquiring spirit. She wanted answers, she wanted activity. The narrowness and frustration of a married woman's life in a remote country village at that time was intolerable to her. She worried about the Bible, she worried about human suffering, about Christ's punishment, about hell. By reading liberal theologians, she managed to ease herself out of the harsh old evangelical beliefs she'd been brought up in. But the respite was only temporary. Her thoughts at this time were moving in a humanist direction. One day she locked herself in the church and then, feeling rather foolish, climbed the pulpit to try out her speaking voice. What had she to say? What is your hope? A heaven in the clouds? I point to a heaven attainable on earth. What? You serve warmly a God unknown and invisible, in a sense only the projected shadow of your own imaginings, and can only serve coldly your brother whom you see at your side. If you want inspiration to feeling, to sentiment, perhaps you'd better keep to your Bible and your creeds. But if you want inspiration to work, Go and walk through the east of London or the back streets of Manchester. You're inspired to tenderness as you gaze at the wounds of Jesus, dead in Judea long ago. And yet you find no inspiration in the wounds of men and women dying in the England of today. I offer you ideals for your homage. Here is truth for your mistress to whose exaltation you shall devote your intellect. Here is freedom for your general, for whose trial... I shall never forget the feeling of power and of delight which came upon me as my voice rolled down the aisles and the passion in me broke into balanced sentences. I felt that all I wanted was to see the church full of upturned faces instead of the emptiness of the silent pews. And as though in a dream, the solitude became peopled and I saw the listening faces and the eager eyes. And as the sentences came unbidden from my lips and my own tones echoed back to me from the pillars of the ancient church, 
I knew of a verity, that the gift of speech was mine. Only a century ago, it was still very difficult for a woman to imagine that she could be a public speaker. A few months later, the crisis came. Annie Besant, the vicar's wife sitting here, did not go up to receive communion, but stood and walked out of the church instead. This was scandalous and open revolt, because any wife, but above all a vicar's wife, was of course expected to be entirely behind her husband. So there was an ultimatum. She must conform or she must leave home. But now it was far too late to bring her back into line. By the end of 1873, at the age of 26, Mrs. Brissant was legally separated from her husband and living in poverty with her two babies in Upper Norwood, London. Now her energies were released. She joined the National Secular Society and met Charles Bradlaugh, the celebrated atheist campaigner. She became co-editor with Bradlaugh of his newspaper, published from this address in Fleet Street. It's still a newspaper office today. Okay. Annie Besant's activity as a militant atheist campaigner was phenomenal. She was assailed at public meetings all over the country and she poured out tracts and articles. Her interest in marriage and the condition of women led to the famous test case on the right to publish birth control information, which she and Bradlaugh fought before the Lord Chief Justice in 1877. They won on appeal, but it cost her the custody of her children, for another court ruled that her views made her unfit to care for them. With Bradlaugh, she also fought the long legal battles over his admission to Parliament. And in those same years, she managed to read a science degree at London University. She was a fighter. Annie Besant was already moving away from Bradlaugh's rather sectarian atheism. She was now an active socialist. She was in the bloody demonstration in Trafalgar Square on November the 13th, 1877, when socialist marchers were met by mounted police and guardsmen with fixed bayonets. Still, Annie Besant's unquiet spirit was not at rest. Perhaps her militant atheism and socialism had taken her too far from her mother and her upbringing. At any rate, she was already dabbling in spiritualism when, one day in 1889, a book came in for her to review. It was H.P. Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine. She was ripe for conversion. I was sitting alone at my desk in the reformer office, immersed in a deep but nearly hopeless longing to solve the riddle of life and mind, when I heard a voice speaking to me. I could see nobody, but the voice said, are you willing to give up everything for the sake of truth? I didn't challenge him or ask questions. I wanted the truth, that was the fact. I was longing to have it intensely. So I went head over heels into the secret doctrine. I'm immersed in Madame Blavatsky. If I perish in the attempt to review her, you must write on my tomb, she has gone to investigate the secret doctrine at first hand. Mrs. Brissant's conversion to theosophy astonished the public. Theosophists believe that Madame Blavatsky was telepathically guided by Tibetan masters, and Annie herself came to think she'd been a Hindu in a previous life. How had she jumped from atheism and socialism straight into such ideas? Well, theosophy was very vigorous and attractive. It appealed to people who were in revolt against narrow, outworn creeds. It offered them a higher teaching the wisdom of the East, an ancient universal truth that underlay all religions alike. And this was just what Annie wanted. Now, in those paradoxical days when so many of the British were looking to India for religious inspiration, talented young Indians were being sent to Britain to learn the ways of their imperial rulers. 
In 1890, the two groups met. Gandhi was a young law student in London. Towards the end of my second year in England, I met two theosophists. They introduced me to Madame Blavatsky and Mrs. Besant. The latter had just joined the Theosophical Society, and I was following with great interest the controversy about her conversion. I also read The Key to Theosophy, which stimulated me to read books on Hinduism, and disabused me of the notion fostered by the missionaries that Hinduism was rife with superstition. Gandhi was profoundly influenced all his life by the teaching of Jesus, especially his concern for the deprived. But when he and Mrs. Besant went to India, they went as apostles not of Christianity and British culture, but of a renaissance of Hinduism. Her 30 years campaigning there prepared the way for his eventual triumph. But the movement was not only in one direction. In 1893, a very remarkable figure had arrived in the West, Vivekananda, the first Hindu missionary. Vivekananda was a young Hindu monk, a pupil of Ramakrishna. He stayed in the West for several years, setting up the Ramakrishna mission and Vedanta societies in America and then in Europe. The British society he founded is still based at Bourne End in Buckinghamshire. Today it attracts a very varied congregation from the home counties and the Midlands, who are multi-religious as well as multi-racial. And one of the Swamis is an Englishman. Vivekananda might be said to have begun to Hinduize the West. He was the first to teach that all religions are one. There are just so many different paths to the same goal. And the goal is the one described in the Vedanta, the union, indeed the identity, of the soul with God. So, in a Ramakrishna center, we find images of several different faiths happily coexisting. But Vivekananda rejected the Christian idea of sin. He taught that simply by living a virtuous life, you could realize the God within yourself. His idea of what it was to live a virtuous life came from the Gita. There Krishna teaches that in order to free yourself from karma, the chain of cause and effect, the wheel of rebirth, you don't have to withdraw from the world like an ascetic. You can do it in the world if you learn to act disinterestedly. You have to do what's right for its own sake and then move on without getting tied down by praise or blame or merit or thought of consequences. In this way, by continually leaving your past behind, you can learn to act with godlike freedom. You can even become God. So today, at their service, his followers still speak of the climax of the ritual as God worshipping God. Vivekananda modernized Hinduism and made it universal. In his teaching, it was possible for an ordinary person living an active life in the world to realize the goal of the mystical life. When we have nobody to grope toward, no devil to blame, no personal God to carry our burdens, when we are alone responsible, then we shall rise to our highest and best. I am responsible for my fate. I am the bringer of good unto myself. I am the bringer of evil. I am the pure and blessed one.
I am not bound by either virtue or vice, by happiness or misery. Pilgrimages and books and ceremonies can never bind me. I have neither hunger nor thirst. The body is not mine, nor am I subject to the superstitions and decay that come to the body. I am existence, knowledge, and bliss absolute. By the end of the 19th century, Indian religion was proving very attractive to many people in the West. The main reason is surely what we call the Hinduization of the West. As the hold of Christian orthodoxy weakened, so great numbers of seekers appeared, people who were looking for a personal faith. Now, India has always been very pluralistic and tolerant. It has many schools of thought, many paths for you to choose from. And the seekers were told by India, religion is made for man, not man for religion. It's right for you to choose the path that suits you. Britain is already a multi-faith society where the religions are at least beginning to borrow from and enrich each other. Could this be taken further and lead to syncretism, a global merger of faiths, roughly along the lines of Vivekananda's teaching? In the 60s, some thought so. In 1967, the first major piece of multi-faith sacred music was composed by Karl Heinz Stockhausen. The text of Stimmung incorporates the names of God in many religions. It expresses the hope of that period that the human race might be able to break through to a new level of consciousness beyond tribalism and violence, a universal mysticism of peace, love and sacred awe. The only The hopes expressed in Stimmung remain unrealized. Where is the modern religious ferment leading us? Well, we live in very well-documented times. If the seeds of the future are already growing, there should be a trace of them here in the BBC Film Library. And one thing you can't miss is an ever-increasing proliferation of new sects and cults. It's as if we're moving to a world in which everyone makes up his own religion for himself. It's like the festival of mind and body. You go to the supermarket and you buy 
What do you want? Peace. The word signifies the arrival of a new age. Now is the time when every performer appeals to all mankind for peace. Rajneesh claims that traditional meditation techniques aren't suitable for Western man. He can't simply sit down and meditate in silence. There's too much going on inside him. First, he has to release pent-up tensions which prevent him from being at peace with himself. Once he is at peace, in meditation, Rajneesh teaches, man can begin to become aware of his true nature and that in reality, God, creation and man himself are all one. People are drawn into these new cults by a desperate personal need for meaning. But as we all know, they're more likely to be trapped than liberated by what they find. For I can't think of a single one of these new cults that's producing literature and spirituality of as good a quality as the best of the past. Well then, perhaps the past can be restored. In many faiths today, there are, after all, fundamentalists who plan to do just that. The strength of fundamentalism now is that it's both devotional and highly political. It rebels against the scepticism and the permissiveness of the modern West. It tries to seize power and to put back the clock. Christ is the answer. Yes, he is the answer to the world's ills today. He is the answer to your ills. He is the answer to your problems. Uh, if you're coming to Jesus, Jesus is the answer to every need uh, of this hour. For several weekends, police have turned out to stop the stoning, and more important, to prevent violent clashes between the zealots and non-religious Israelis determined to exercise their right to use the highways. It's only under the threat of such counteraction, in fact, that the authorities have moved seriously to curb the religious zealots, for the religious lobby in Parliament is extremely powerful, and even if they don't condone stone-throwing, preservation of the Sabbath is one of their chief objectives. We hear a lot of talk about the ecumenical movement. They say that we should get together and all be one big family. Catholic, Protestant, and Jew. Worried by the demonstration, the government responded by increasing their indoctrination program. These school children are being taken to see an exhibition dedicated to dead politicians. To Khomeini, the Mujahideen demonstration showed the dangers of education, for the majority are young and students. The government ordered the Revolutionary Guards to search out the Mujahideen and destroy them. They had authority to execute immediately anyone seen with a gun or helping an armed man. For Islam in Iran is a passionate, pervasive force. This is Ashura, the most important festival of the year. The death of a saint 1300 years ago, fighting alone against impossible odds, is exactly how Iran feels about the world today. Religion in Iran demands and gets a total response. Again, I'm skeptical. I suspect Hegel was right when he said that an older form of consciousness can never really be restored. Fundamentalism can't understand the spirit of science, of human rights, of pluralism, and so it can't govern a modern state successfully. When it takes over, the economy declines. The people get restive, they begin to lynch deviants and to demand wars. Is there then a way forward? One theme of religion has always been the relating of the individual to a greater whole. The French Jesuit and scientist, Taillard de Chardin, 
tried to develop a modern form of that idea, and some people see it actually happening now through the electronic revolution. The whole Earth is being surrounded by a humming web of electrical pulses that carry all human knowledge and communication. Is there in this the gradual emergence of a global superbrain that we can all tap into? Already we've extended it some way into space. Perhaps one day it will hook up with similar electronic networks elsewhere in the universe. So gradually the universe will become alive with communication. It will become conscious of itself. That electronic mysticism makes me uneasy. It seems to have forgotten the primacy of the individual will and the individual conscience. You know, religion has many facets. It's a personal quest for meaning. It's a social bond. It's a way of taking up the self into a larger whole. But it's also always been a moral crusade to change the world. And in that role, it's still very much alive. Now this village, like other villages all over the Philippines, harbors Filipino communists. They call themselves the New People's Army, part of the armed wing of an alliance of radical forces, mostly communist, called the National Democratic Front. For security reasons, most of them can't show their faces to the camera. One of them can. He is already well known to the authorities. He is a Catholic priest, Father Conrado Balweg. He is one of the most wanted men in the Philippines. Despairing of peaceful political change, Father Balweg has given up the ritual of the mass to be a guerrilla. I do not uh, understand why people would be bothered you know, if a priest take up arms to you know, defend the life of people who are unjustly and violently killed day in and day out. I'm not saying the rituals of the mass every day. Because what I am doing now, being linked with the daily activities of the people in their struggle to liberate themselves from oppression and exploitation, that is the essence of the mass. I like liberation theology, but that young priest makes me uneasy. Haven't we seen all too much of Christian gunmen, Muslim militias and the rest in recent years? You know, in the 60s, people thought religion was fast disappearing from the world as it became completely secular. But not now. Religion's back as a major political force. But even in this brief survey, we've seen that the forms in which it's coming back are all too often eccentric, fanatical and divisive. They seem to suggest a future of war rather than peace. What happened to the old dream of a union of mysticism and human values? Can the faiths again become universal and reconciling? At every level of modern life, from the nuclear arms race to the video game arcade, we sense a connection between the loss of meaning and a drift of violence. The new international popular culture makes us uneasy. It seems to be shallow and dreamlike, a culture of play and fantasy violence dominated by hollow, glaring images. Moral reality, a sense of history, roots in nature and the earth are in danger of being lost. We sense the coming of a world more secular, more spiritually disoriented, and more disorderly than ever before. Once, religion gave life stability and meaning by providing an encompassing myth and a moral order. But has it still the power to do so in a mobile, multicultural world? Today's mixing of cultures and faiths could lead to an age of peace, a multi-faith mysticism with Asian and Christian strands. But many faiths, including Christianity, are very reluctant to give up their old exclusive claims. 
Will religion in the future divide people or unite them? Every religion has something in it that is local and ethnic and something that's universal. The problem is that everything that's most colorful and attractive, everything people are most deeply attached to, is on the local and ethnic side. The names of the gods, the images and rituals, the ancestral customs and beliefs. But if you remove all that local stuff so as not to give offense to other people, if you take away all that's peculiar and divisive in religion, what have you left? Something like the interdenominational chapel at London Airport and a solitary seeker meditating in a bare room. Can the spiritual life flourish in a climate as austere as this? Maybe it can. After all, the 20th century has seen a great revival of interest in mysticism and religious experience. And those disillusioned Europeans whom we saw turning to India were the pioneers. They reacted against a Christianity that had become cold and authoritarian. Its God seemed to be so remote that it had nothing better to offer than dogmas to be believed on authority. By contrast, India seemed to promise something better, immediate experience of a kind that bypasses the power structures of organized religion. This discovery of Indian mysticism led to a parallel rediscovery of Christian mysticism. If the Indians said, in the end, the externals fall away, God and the self, Brahman and Atman are one, the Christian could reply, God dwells in our hearts. Such language is, of course, obscure and ambiguous. What's it mean? It seems to imply that your God is an image of what you are to become, the goal of your spiritual quest. Through a disciplined practice of religion, you can purify and enlarge your consciousness, your powers, your sympathies, and so gradually close the old gap between God and man until there's just one divine human reality. Now this fusion of ancient mysticism and modern humanism was first accomplished by Vivekananda, though a few in the West, like the Catholic monk Thomas Merton, have attempted something similar. And it's a hopeful thought. It suggests that religion and humanism need not be seen as mortal enemies. On the contrary, a disciplined and purified practice of religion may be the best way to achieve the ends of humanism.